It's my very great pleasure to, in, uh, to welcome you to the final day of this ISMB conference. I have a few uh, housekeeping notes uh, that I'll start off with. So today in this session, we have two special award presentations. Um, and after the, the first award for Cyrus Chothia, please uh, don't get up and, and run away. We, we do have another very special award as well. I'd like to remind you that there are two um, uh, special birds of a feather sessions uh, at lunchtime today, at, starting at 12.40. So the first is in Liffier, and that's industry jobs and training. And we also have uh, another birds of a feather on the ECCB development, which is in Wicklow A. So please do go along to those and, and contribute. Now, uh, Diane's asked me to remind you uh, any Travel Fellowship Award winners that you must sign out at the end of the uh, conference at the ISCB booth. And now I'd like to uh, welcome Teresa Prushtka to the stage, who is the ISMB 2016 Conference Chair to tell you more about uh, our next great uh, installment of ISMB. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I would like to uh, invite you all to the next ISMB, which will be in July 8 to 12 uh, in Orlando. Now, uh, I will be co-chairing it with Spear Baldi. Um, okay. We uh, have a, already a list of wonderful con uh, confirmed speakers. Sandra Dodoin from uh, Berkeley, Rus Nosinos from NCI NIH, Sarah Teichman from MBL EBI. Um, the location is wonderful. Uh, we invite you to Walt Disney uh, Swam and Dolphin, uh, with, um, you know, in the center of all the life in Orlando, with lots of activities. Uh, I We'll start to list some of them, but you will soon see that there's more activities than the days of the conference, so you may want to stay a little bit longer. Um, so here's some more. Uh, the hotels are also very nice with lots of uh, restaurants, swimming pools, um, all the important um, commodities. Uh, and I would like to uh, underscore that there's actually, I would assume that you may want to take children that there will be some supervised children activities, so please don't be shy to bring your children too. And uh, the getting to the Orlando is also going to be very convenient with uh, lots of international flights. And if you are uh, more nearby, you can also, uh, you can also connect by train. Uh, and uh, some more information, I will invite you to, to see the movie. So I hope to see you all next year in Orlando, and please follow the web page for any new announcement and any new information about the conference. Thank you all.
Okay, well, thank you very much, Teresa. So uh, I know what I'm doing uh, next time. There may be some conference involved. There may be some playing. Looks great, so thank you very much. Okay, so on to the next item of business. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce Cyrus Chothia, the recipient of the 2015 ISCB Accomplishment by a Senior Scientist Award. Cyrus Chothia was selected as the 2015 recipient for his groundbreaking work using computation to understand protein structure and function and the evolution of genomes. Cyrus Chothri is well known for using computation to study protein structure, and his early work showed that relatively simple principles govern the structure of proteins, regardless of their structural complexity. His research has been critical to understanding and classifying proteins based on their structural folds, and he's shown that changes to protein structure can be accommodated by structural shifts. More recently, uh, Chothia developed computational approaches based on his knowledge of protein structure to understand how gene duplication and recombination um, between particular domains drives genome evolution. Cyrus's illustrious career includes election as a fellow of the Royal Society in 2000, and he's mentored numerous students and postdoctoral fellows, uh, including myself, um, and many of uh, these have gone on to, to do great things. Chothia's work throughout his career has been instrumental to the birth of the fields of structural bioinformatics and computational genomics. Now, in recent years, Cyrus has developed a dysphasia, which is a condition that affects his speech. It can sometimes be difficult for Cyrus to find exactly the right words. They're just on the tip of his tongue. So we decided that in place of the usual keynote format, that we would ask three former colleagues of Cyrus to present some of the major achievements uh, through his research career. Although Cyrus would be very, very happy to talk individually with people at the end of the keynote. So the presentation will be given by uh, Dr. Arthur Lesk, Cyrus's long-term collaborator and professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at Penn State. Stephen Brenner, a former graduate student and now professor at the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, and Julian Goff, a former graduate student and now professor of bioinformatics in the Department of Computer Science at Bristol University. These three have worked with Cyrus across a broad range of his career, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing their perspectives on the achievements of Cyrus Chothia in Cyrus's keynote titled, How Lucky Have I Been? But first, uh, we will present a short video uh, from Cyrus's recent award of the Dan David Prize. Thank you. My name is Cyrus Chotia, and I work at the Medical Research Council's Laboratories of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. What I work on is understanding the nature of proteins. Proteins are of extreme importance because they're the fundamental material of which organisms are made. And the way they function tells you how organisms work. The good thing about working at LMB is that it gives you a great deal of freedom to investigate problems. One of the most important aspects of this is the invention of the SCOP database. What the SCOP database tells us is how proteins work. We can understand how the atomic groups function and interact. As a scientist, what I enjoy doing is investigating different problems which can be understood by looking at the data you get from examination of, of proteins. Trying to look at the atomic components, the ways in which different atomic components are put together, and the ways in which large 
components can then be linked to other components to produce different functions. And solutions to problems is sometimes very difficult and sometimes not, and sometimes very easy. I would investigate things which would become, say, difficult because I couldn't see how they fitted together. In other times, I would see how they fitted together very quickly. We were so sometimes frustrated, and other times, extremely pleased with a sudden insight. And that's how I think science works. Okay, so now I'd like to invite Cyrus uh, up to the podium to say a few short words. Cyrus. I'm just going to say a few words, which I meant to have to really have to say about the people who, with, with, with whom I first first entered science. I was I was being very lucky with the people I've worked for, the places and the places where I've worked. I want to mention three people, three three of those collaborators with whom I work. The first was my PhD supervisor, Peter Paulin, and he gave me freedom to, to, to work with my own ideas and, 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 and publish papers of, 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 in my own name. Then with Joe Janine, a, a French colleague, I published some, some 18 papers when I, when, when I was, when I was in, 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 in France. And then Arthur, Arthur Lesk, I eventually came to Cambridge. And what I did with him was publish another 43, 36 papers. I've had these numbers of, I've also I've had a number of students, very good students, many of them, who have become good, good scientists themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Silas. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Arthur to begin our presentation. So, this will be a scientific talk. I will permit myself one personal comment at the beginning and one at the end. The beginning one is that my interactions with Cyrus have been one of the defining relationships of my life, both professionally and personally. Now, Cyrus started out, as was mentioned, with a PhD, Peter Pauling. They were interested in molecules involved in neurotransmission and other related things. It was small molecule crystallography. He then moved to LMB, did a postdoc with David Blow, and this was proteins. Then it was wandering for a while. Fred Richards was undoubtedly a important influence on him. Fred was one of the first people to recognize the importance of computation in protein science. He worked with Michael and Joël Janin and Pasteur in Paris. They returned to England in 1976, and perhaps one um, publication from this prehistory is worth remembering. The structural patterns paper with Michael is what led ultimately to SCOP, in those days, there were only a very few, a handful of proteins to work with. 
so they could only classify things on a very gross level. Nevertheless, it started the whole industry. Notice, by the way, the address, 1976, the address is still pa the Pasteur in Paris. Then, returning to Cambridge, just when I arrived, Cyrus was in the process of working with Joyce Baldwin on a paper on the allosteric transition in hemoglobin. He and I wrote a paper on the evolution of the globins, taking advantage of what was then a relatively large variety of structures of globins, and which now is extremely small. And I point out a couple of things to you. First of all, it, it turns out by coincidence, both papers are 46 pages long, one page per chromosome, if you like. They were relatively long for theoretical papers. They um, take-home message is that Cyrus had a lot to say. That's one take-home message. There were some very long papers. Bill Lipscomb published an article on the structure of a carboxypeptidase in which the coordinates were listed on paper in a table in the paper, and that was the publication of the structure. You people don't believe me, but that's true. This was before the PDB was available in computer-readable form. Some of us are still annoyed that it still isn't, but that's a separate issue. The, the other point is that if you look closely, Cyrus's address is still University College London, which was the lab of Peter Pauling. The LMB wasn't paying him, and I think it's very easily arguable that the MRC got its money's worth out of these papers, given that um, they didn't pay him at all. And what we had done was look at different uh, globin structures. Now, from today's point of view, these two structures are very, very similar. In those days, they were surprisingly different. I don't have time to enumerate the differences. I made a movie, but I don't have time to show it. What we found was the importance of helix-helix contacts as the determinants of structures, and that the discrete geometries of helix-helix interactions, which Cyrus had worked out before I arrived, produced discrete geometries of the interhelical angles. So this is a plot showing how different helix-helix contacts cluster in terms of the interhelical angle and distance, and they're produced by different packing patterns at the interface. The picture on the right looks as if it shows a shift or rotation in the B helix, but what's really going on is that there's a shift of the BE contact and a compensatory shift in the BG contact to maintain the binding site. The take home message was proteins can undergo relatively large conformational changes, but these changes are globally coupled to maintain a binding site. The reticulation of the residues at the interfaces are largely conserved. This is the BG contact in the globins we studied. There's a core of the interface that, in which the corresponding residues are in contact. And this, of course, led to ideas like those in Dolly, where the conservation of residue contact patterns is used for structural alignment, and more recently in using evolution of residue contact patterns to predict structures, which has been quite successful recently. We went on to look at other pairs of homologous structures. We then took up the question of insulin. I mean, it's a long story how we started to study this, but I won't go into it. But the main point is, it wasn't clear to what precision sequence determined structure. Now, insulin was to Oxford what hemoglobin was to Cambridge. This is the four zinc structure, trimer of dimers, the trigonal symmetry is crystallographic, the dimeric symmetry is not, and one of the puzzles of insulin was that if you superpose the two of the chains, there's a phenylalanine that points in to the domain in one molecule and out in the other. They couldn't both point out because they'd clash. 
But why did one point in and one point out? And Cyrus and I worked on this and found that we could trace the difference to a crystal packing interaction at the surface of the molecule, which was transmitted right through the molecule. This work on comparing structures of homologous domains led to this paper in which we produced a chart which shows that there's a relationship between deviation of sequence and deviation of structure that holds for all different proteins. So each point corresponds to a pair of homologous proteins, but they're from all kinds of different families. And they all fit on the same curve, which is very interesting. The requirement is that you identify a core of the structure and apply these numbers to that. At this point, oh, and the core size varies with the, uh, the divergence. At this point, we said, well, we really ought to use this to test whether we can make it, produce, make it useful for prediction. And this was the idea of homology modeling. And all the principles of CASP applied, although CASP wasn't, um, hadn't started then. We needed a blind test, so it had to be a structure in progress. And we needed something that was going on that we wouldn't have to wait 10 years to find the answer. There was an added constraint, and this was we had to have a crystallographer with whom we could get along. I won't put any numbers on this, but it excluded a fairly large proportion of the community. And we ended up working with Simon Phillips. Simon Phillips had done a lot of work at the LMB on myoglobin. He was then working at the Pasteur with Roberto Poliak on the structure of D13. Now, D13 was a fab fragment. Let's see if I can get this to work. Fab fragment, this part of an antibody. It was the first monoclonal antibody to be uh, crystallized. The upper left picture shows roughly how the antibody structure is divided into domains and fragments. The antigen binding site is out at the wingtips. And when you think about it, this was the dumbest possible choice of any possible choice for testing the idea of divergence of sequence and structure for homology modeling. Why? Because the core of the domain of antibodies is very tightly conserved. All the interest is in the antigen binding loops, which are outside the core and have nothing to do with the kind of predictions that we could make. And it was absolutely useless in terms of applying this curve, which I won't skip back to, to the quality of possible homology models. However, it led us to an entirely separate project into what determines the structure of antibody combining loops of antibodies. And we came up with this canonical structure model where five of the six antigen binding loops seem to have a set of a repertoire of individual discrete conformations and we can spot sequence signatures that tell us which they have. H3, the third hypervariable region of the heavy chain, is completely different. It's really weird. There's a set of antibodies from the cow in which they actually have an inserted domain. So they're not just loops. But for the five loops, light chain loops, the first two heavy chain loops, the conical structure model worked pretty well. We all got together, including a number of people in the audience today, and did a blind test, not a prediction of the core structure, that was trivial, but of the antigen binding loops. And we did pretty well. The canonical structure model did pretty well, and it's been used by many people. Finally, Merzen arrived, and he was really a very valuable colleague. I'm not going to talk about SCOP, but we did some work on beta barrels, the basic ideas go back to an old paper by Andrew McLaughlin in which he said that the geometry 
beta barrels could be described by a small number of parameters, the number of strands and what he called the shear number. A shear number of zero would be strands parallel to the axis, but if the strands are tipped, then the corresponding, uh, the red strand duplicates the black strand on the left, and the fact that if you go perpendicular to the strands, you come out in a displaced pers uh, place, eight residues off, that's the shear number. Different barrels have different numbers of strands and shear numbers, and what we found was that you could write down a periodic table of possible barrel geometries. And just knowing the number of strands and the shear number, you would be able to predict a great deal about the overall geometry of the barrel. And this is a kind of goal that a very few people have. I have it, Willie Taylor has it. Would it be possible to write down a list of all possible protein structures and then check off which ones we see and which ones we don't, and why don't we see the ones we don't. This is for a very restricted class of structures, but it works for that. Serum proteases don't follow this simple scheme, and that's a very interesting story. And finally, I have another sabbatical coming up. That's my second personal comment. So thank you very much. I am Stephen Brenner, and I worked with Cyrus as a graduate student from 1993 until 1997. And to me, it's really amazing to be here at many levels. Well, first, I want to thank um, Jean Chothia for sharing with me these slides, which I'll be showing you, some snapshots taken with Cyrus. But it's amazing once because of all the profound contributions that Cyrus has made, the discoveries he's had that are really bedrock principles for all that our field does. It's also amazing for me to be here personally because Cyrus had always astonished me. And so on a personal note, I came to Cambridge after having been for a while at Microsoft coding up systems. And so I was sweating every detail, trying to make sure it wasn't my code, which led to the inexorable blue screen of death, which you would ultimately receive. But when I came to Cambridge, Cyrus was proud that his budget until that time had always consisted only of pencils and paper. For what he would do is he would sit in his small, cramped office and look long and hard and deeply at a handful of proteins and then emerge with grand pronouncements about protein evolution and structure. And for me to make such statements from such limited data was really bewildering. But the thing that was really astonishing was that he would be right. He was always right. His insight was unbelievable. Now, part of it was because he didn't explain every bit of detail. He focused on the big picture, and the nature of what he would do is he would resolve what seemed to be infinite and continuous problems and turn them into problems that were discrete and tractable. This made them understandable and amenable for further study. And so Mark Gerstein has actually called this the Chothia School of Thought which focused on having these principles of bringing things from this continuous infinite world to a world where things were discrete and tractable, and then being able to understand them in detail. Now, when I first came to Cambridge, one of the very first talks that he presented was titled, A Perfect Structural, Genomics, a Perfect Structural Biology Program for Genomes. And he began with an argument about the value of low resolution models, like for example, this one here, we heard a little bit about it from Arthur just now, in a place where collecting high resolution data had been so important, collecting high resolution, really impressive protein structures was so important, Cyrus was arguing for the value of models. Now to me, that seemed obvious because they revealed so much. But only later it became clear to me why he was making these arguments when I was actually just finishing my PhD in Cambridge, there was some um, honorary dinner, I forget the details of it, and I got there a little early, and one of the division directors was there, and he didn't know who I was, he asked what I did, I told him what I was working on with computation and structure and genomics, and responded by saying, 
gee, that's the sort of work that I thought the LMB should have gotten rid of years ago. But the LMB provided Cyrus the freedom to explore these directions, and he thrived. And so with his perfect structural biology program for, um, structural biology program for genome projects, it was based on several principles. One was that genomes at that point were becoming imminent. The second was an observation he made, and I think it was an extremely timely observation, was at that point, there's about one structure being solved per day, about one new interesting structure being solved per day. Whereas until that time, structures had been an extraordinarily precious resource and very, very few in number, and everyone had to be truly loved in intimate detail by the entire community, but now you could produce them in larger volumes. The second thing is a paper which I think actually epitomizes much of Cyrus's school, as it were, as Mark Gerstein has called it, his paper, 1,000 Families from Like Biologist, which, as he described to me, was a back-of-the-envelope calculation and showed that a very large fraction of all the proteins that we would see belonged to a relatively modest number of protein families. Until that point, it seemed like there'd be more and more proteins forever and there'd really be no end to them. And to some extent, that may be true, but you can explain a vast amount of the protein biology by putting things together into families. And I think a vast amount of the biology we do is predicated on the idea that we can understand protein families and a, a, a countable number of protein families explain a vast majority of the biology that we see. And ultimately, one conclusion from this is that we could actually think about using these one structures per day and as we're continually increasing to actually go after all these thousand families. And as you heard in Michael Levitt's talk earlier this week, that this is actually, I think, the genesis of structural genomics. And what you can see here on this plot is basically a novel of novel structures, structures that come from new PFAM families being solved each year from around the time that Cyrus made this observation up until 2005, which is sort of the peak of, of structural genomics. And what you can see is that worldwide structural genomics at that point was accounting for about half of the novelty in new um, proteins from new families, even as actually traditional structural biology was reducing its interest in, in solving the structures of proteins coming from new families. And indeed, um, my colleague John Mark Shindoni has shown that as structural genomics has come to an end, we've actually gone down to the level of novelty we had back when Cyrus first made these predictions. If you want to hear more about that, um, John Mark will be talking about that later today. But what I want to talk about really, um, well, first I want to talk a little bit more, is just a sense of a few other examples of how Cyrus really provided this amazing ability to distill in so many different ways these large, sort of incomprehensibly complex and continuous problems at once which suddenly became understandable. And I'll just sort of point out a, sort of a few points from each, from one or a couple of points from each of these papers. For example, one of his early papers pointed out, for example, that in the core proteins, that they are packed as densely as the crystals of the constituent amino acids. It's a simple statement, but one which was not at all obvious at the time that, that he made it. Or the fact that the cores of proteins evolve more slowly than surfaces. We now take this for granted, but in fact, this was something that had to be discovered, and Cyrus was responsible for much of that discovery. We heard from Arthur about all the things Cyrus has done involved in understanding how proteins are put together, seeing how beta pleated sheets go together, how, the, how beta barrels can be put together from those beta sheets, how helices pack together, how those helices can then pack onto the beta sheets. And then, working with, with Mark Gerstein, how loops can actually move. It turns out they don't move in all possible ways, they move in discrete ways, in certain classes of ways. And then how entire proteins can move. And again, this was not an unlimited number of different ways this can happen, but a discrete set of ways. It certainly turned what something which seemed like unfathomable into something that which was tractable and could really be explored in detail. And then since then, that there's been explorations in genomics looking to see how domains get combined. Um, that the fact that proteins which were thought to be really exquisitely specific to particular biological functions in individual species may in fact have extraordinarily long histories. And the fact that mutations that occur in proteins that can cause disease are not primarily at the active or interaction sites, as I think most of us had assumed at that time, but in fact that destabilization is one of the key factors. This is now a principle that underlies a vast fraction of all of the genomic analyses that goes on, but one which was really not obvious until some of the analyses that Cyrus was involved in. Now, Cyrus is not normally coy. So I was really quite interested to see in the, in the official biography that's written for, them, for him for the award, it says that Cyrus Chothia's PhD research examined confirmations of molecules at nerve receptors. And 
uh, Mark Gerstein said I had to include a little more information about this. And so he was actually studying, one of the molecules he's studying, or a few of the molecules he's studying are these ones here. Most of you probably don't recognize these, but you might recognize their names. The potent hallucinogen d lysergic acid diethylamide. Now there's certain ways in which this too even fits into the Chothia school. First of all, if you actually read the abstract of this, it talks about how there are only a few possible conformations of all the possible continuous conformations that, that these molecules take on, and that this leads to a structural correlation between the probable conformations of hallucinogenic molecules and those which are, are involved as neurotransmitters. So again, reducing the infinite complexity down to an understandable state led to biological discovery. And this also shows the importance and the nature of his timeliness. This work was done in 1969. I can't think of a better time to have done it, um, done with Peter Pauling, and then contributed by Linus Pauling to PNAS. Now, as Arthur said, the deep history of SCOP comes from the work that he did with Michael Levitt, uh, where from a very small number of proteins, the two of them recognized that there were some core packing patterns that occurred. The folds all alpha, all beta, alpha plus beta, and alpha slash beta. And what Cyrus asked me primarily to talk you about was actually the early history of SCOP, because I'd sent him a document about my own experiences with it. It was a time which was really seared into my memory, because it was actually a difficult time for me. At that point, I had been suffering from a mysterious abdominal ailment for two months and was actually an inpatient in the hospital. And Cyrus called a meeting for people to come together. I wasn't invited because I was in the hospital, um, but it turned out that you could go from Adam Brooks Hospital, where I was, through the steam tunnels over to the LMB. And so this is what I did to crash that meeting um, and to create what was called, what we ultimately called the structural classification of proteins. Now, there were several things that came together in being able to make this possible, motivating this meeting that Cyrus called. The first, again, was the observation that there was one structure being solved per day, and this was increasing. So there would be a lot of structures soon, and it would make sense to begin to organize them because it wouldn't be possible for anyone to really know all of them. The second was the thousand families principle. This would be a tractable thing for us to take on. Another thing that was very important was that Cyrus had become extremely interested in the power of hidden Markov models. We hear a little bit more about this, I think, from Julian Goff coming next. And in fact, what Cyrus, I think, really wanted to create from this was a set of awesome HMMs. People recognize very, very distant homology. And SCOP ended up being basically subverted from that goal as we developed it and realized that actually the hierarchy we we're building was useful in and of itself. So where did SCOP actually come from? There are two more other points that are important. I'll get to them in a moment. So where did actually SCOP come from, the name? Well, we played around with different acronyms to use. And eventually, um, Cyrus was flipping through this enormous dictionary and came across SHOP. That's the correct um, pronunciation of this old English word. And it's an old English word for an English poet or minstrel, very poetic. And after having more or less chosen that as a likely choice for the name of it, we learned then from Alexei Merzin that skopum was, was actually a Russian root word, which also means pile or accumulation, bringing things together, which seemed, once we had that, that then we knew that that, that would be the right thing as a name for skop. So most of you actually are familiar with what skop is, so I'll only take a moment to describe it. Um, it's this classification. It's actually a misnomer. It is, does involve structural classification, but that's actually not its primary role. It's primarily an evolutionary classification with all these aspects of the, of the classification being evolutionary almost entirely, the upper levels only up through here being structurally based, and the most important level, in my view, being the superfamily, which uses structural principle and detailed knowledge to be able to recognize very ancient evolutionary relationships that generally would not be able to be recognized from sequence. And as we were trying to put together this classification, we've, it turns out that it was now the oldest classification that's hierarchical that's on the World Wide Web. It was built only a couple of months after Yahoo built its classification in taxonomy in the entire World Wide Web. And in fact, when we first discovered Yahoo after we had built SCOP, we said, oh, they've made a SCOP for the World Wide Web. Um, and both of them continued on. Um, SCOP reached its sort of final conclusion um, in its initial iteration in 2009. Yahoo actually lasted until 2014 and then died, but SCOP has now been reborn in, in two versions. One is SCOP 2, an extension that's being built by Alexei Merzin and his collaborators, which has a more expressive way of describing evolutionary relationships, and the SCOPE database, which extends the, the classifications of SCOP to include more proteins. So then finally, extremely fundamental to actually making SCOP happen was the absolutely inexplicably encyclopedic atomic knowledge of all proteins that Alexei Merzin had. And so at this meeting that Cyrus held, 
Alexi started drawing circles on the board. Some of them were inside other circles, some of them were next to other circles, but they never intersected. And eventually it became clear that what he was drawing was a hierarchy, a hierarchy by which these different proteins were related, and that is really what became the SCOP hierarchy. Another critical person beyond Cyrus and in, in, in Alexei in building this classification was Tim Hubbard. And actually, Tim tells me a few interesting notes about this first meeting. One was that he said that in all his years at the LMB, it was the only project meeting he had ever been invited to, which is completely different from his experience at the Sanger and at the CPE, where he had been, where he had been separately. And Tim saw this, actually, as a way to be able to extract from Alexei Alexei's comprehensive knowledge of all the different beta barrel proteins, which Tim wanted to do analyses on, you heard about how they all fall into this small set of categories with their NNS numbers, but there was no mapping of all the proteins to their numbers, and, and Tim saw this as a way to extract all of them. And so Tim was actually also a particular aficionado of his favorite protein, triosphosphate isomerase, a beta alpha 8 barrel. And we would tease him, saying, you only like it because that's a Tim barrel, and you're Tim. And he would respond invariably, no, I, I've always liked them best. Okay, I didn't get that. It's beardish humor. I don't get it either. It's fine. <laughs> so, so, so SCOP has had a huge impact. Um, as you can see here, that it now um, this original SCOP paper has had over 6,000 citations, according to Google Scholar. Um, and that if you take all the SCOP papers, it's nearly 10,000 citations to all of them. To put that in context, the Thousand Genomes Project, which of course was a vastly larger effort, has about half as many citations. Now, of course, it hasn't been uh, going for nearly as long, but I can also say that the persistence time of the, of the citations for Thousand Genomes has actually been vastly less than the persistence time of those for SCOP. And SCOP has been used for all sorts of different sources. This is a study that was done um, by Nomi Fox and John Mark Chandoni, looking to see actually who was using SCOP and why they were using it. We found people were using it to study protein structure evolution computationally, to train or benchmark algorithms, to augment other databases with SCOP classification, to examine classifications of a handful of proteins sort of one at a time. And then actually a small thing on this, on this chart here, but one which actually has had a disproportionate impact, is that there have been many databases which have been derived from SCOP and from Astral and have led to them um, onward uses. Interestingly, there are actually a large number of people who actually cite SCOP but don't bother to actually use it, and about an equally large number who use it but based on full-text search appear not to cite it. And so some of the resources, um, for example, that cite SCOP, some of them use it intensely, other ones simply just refer to it as something to compare to, are some of the many ones that you've seen here. And some of the things that Cyrus did with me in trying to actually um, try to use SCOP was first to actually use the structural classification to understand sequence. And this allowed us, for example, to begin by being able to say what sequence comparison methods work better than others, because it gave us a gold standard. The super family level allowed us to identify proteins which were generally too distant to be recognized by sequence, and if they were in different folds, we could be almost certain that they'd be unrelated to each other, so we both had a positive control set and a negative control set on which we could test different methods. And we were able to see that, for example, that some slower methods for doing sequence comparison worked better than some of the faster ones, but more importantly, that many of the heuristic ways by which people scored protein similarity really didn't work at all. In particular, we were able to say what were reliable matches, which was something you really could not do up until that point. And so we were able to see that, for example, the statistics that have been put into, the, into these methods worked much better than, the, than arbitrary things based um, on, on um, percent identity. And for example, if you looked at percent identity, you could find proteins which would have 39% identity, but actually look um, incredibly different. And then we applied this, for example, to genomes and be able to discover in the very first genome that there were vast numbers of duplications which no one had been able to identify before, in part because they were not able to reliably identify what were the homologous proteins. And we'll hear more a little about that, I think, from Julian Goff. So I want to conclude with another comment um, that I've read in Cyrus's official biography from the ISCB award, that apparently he'd originally wanted to be a historian, but was dissuaded from it because of his difficulty with, with learning different languages. And I find this actually ironic and fascinating because then Cyrus went to chemistry and he learned the language of proteins. And with that language, I think he has been one of the most important historians ever, understanding the history of molecules over eons and informing all of us. And so Cyrus has said how lucky he has been, but I think this award recognizes how lucky we all have been from all of his discoveries 
And finally, Cyrus, I want to say how lucky I have been for all you've taught me. Thank you, Cyrus. Next, we'll have Julian Goff talking about Cyrus's current sesquidecade. That's better. Um, right, so what I'm going to be talking to you about is from uh, SCOP up to today. The first thing that I should point out about this period is that if you try to write out or summarize Cyrus's um, contributions to the field, as Madame Babu has done here, then um, at the very end of the list here in 1995, you have SCOP. And so talking about um, the part of the work from SCOP to today is actually just, uh, in the grand scheme of things, um, a very small amount of recent history. So we've heard about how when when SCOP was conceived of and, and designed and the purposes um, for, for, for which it was, um, it was, it was thought up. Um, and what it does is using uh, a unique way of thinking, of looking at data and organizing things um, to create SCOP, which we've heard about. Now, um, around the time that SCOP was released in 1995, this was around the time that things were beginning to pick up with uh, genome sequencing, which, as we've heard, was uh, thought about and very much um, whilst SCOP was created. Um, but it's having organized uh, and, uh, and created a system for understanding protein structure, it's clear that the next challenge uh, was to do the same, is to organize and understand um, uh, genomes and genome sequences. So to do this, there were two really important uh, realizations. One of these um, was regarding hidden Markov models. Here we have uh, a, a figure showing an, an equivalent of a rock curve for um, different sequence comparison methods using SCOP, using the gold standard of structures as a benchmark. And what this showed is that hidden Markov models are going to be uh, the weapon of choice that they outperform other methods and that um, profile methods in general uh, are, are, are many, many times more sensitive than pairwise methods such as BLAST. So armed with this, um, uh, with this, with this knowledge, it was possible to proceed. However, I think it's fair to say that, that this realization and publishing that in this paper has also had a much wider impact on the field in terms of the use and the popularity of hidden Markov models. Now, the second thing, which is maybe far less obvious and less well known, that the, the second realization which had to be made to proceed is that within SCOP, the classification is enough. So to explain what I mean by that, here is a figure. Uh, it's an image from 1999. And on either side um, of the line, you have uh, two identical maps of sequence space. This is hypothetical, of course, um, where the crosses represent uh, uh, individual sequences, and blue ones are colored to be members of a, a specific superfamily, and the red ones around the outside um, are, are unrelated sequences. So on the right, we show how you might try to model this space with a hidden Markov model, uh, with a single hidden Markov model. Now, when Scott was originally conceived, the direction it was headed in was the idea that for each superfamily, there would be high-quality structural alignments for each of these superfamilies. But the, the realization that, that Cyrus made is that actually you don't need these high quality structural alignments to proceed and that the classification is, is enough. So on the other side of the image, you see what happens if you build a single model for all of the different structures and take the union of these models um, as the way that you will model that superfamily. And this is actually, um, in many ways, gives you a more precise modeling of a superfamily um, than trying to, to fit all that information into a single model. So armed with these two things, the knowledge that the classification in SCOP was enough and that hidden Markov models uh, are the, uh, provide the tool with, that, that's needed, um, the following became possible. So as you know, uh, the PDB 
classifies structures which are determined mostly at that time by crystallography and NMR. And in Scott, these are broken into their constituent domains and classified into superfamilies. So what was now possible was to build hidden Markov models for each of these structures and produce a library. So at the bottom, we see a, a, a pictorial representation of a single sequence which has been scanned against that library of hidden Markov models to detect and classify um, the, uh, the structural domains in that, in that sequence. And of course, the point of this uh, was to do this for all sequences in completely sequenced genomes um, as the first step to laying down the infrastructure to being able to think about and to organize and understand genomes in the same way as had been done for protein structures. So this resulted in the superfamily database, and here is a screenshot from the year 2000 showing it in Netscape. Um, and so what it provided, uh, uh, what it, this infrastructure enabled um, was, was this way of organizing and understanding. And the way in which this was cast by Cyrus is the concept of treating a whole organism as in terms of its genome repertoire. That is, um, if, you, if you look at the figure on the right, to take proteins and represent, represent them as um, uh, put together by their constituent domains and treating the whole organism as this collection of proteins made up of domains um, which have come about in evolution through duplication and recombination. Um, so these two figures are taken from uh, uh, the paper on the bottom, but what I meant to say was that um, the top paper in 98 shows that intention um, of doing, looking at, at, at whole genomes. Um, but we can see very clearly from the title of this paper in 2003, which is the evolution of the protein repertoire, um, really capturing that concept. So I'm now going to move on. So, so from this way of organizing and looking and thinking about uh, organisms in terms of their um, of their repertoire of structural domains and organizations, uh, we, um, uh, many things um, uh, uh, were given to us um, as discoveries in evolution. And I'm going to mention a few of these, um, but by no means all of them. So the first one I'm going to mention um, is that the repertoire of structural domains is largely invariant. So this is a, a, a figure from a Keystone Conference in 2002. And there's a column for each uh, of five organisms, uh, yeast, Drosophila, C. elegans, Arabidopsis, and human. And on the y-axis, we have the number of domains which were detected and classified at that time. And what we have colored blue in each of these columns is those domains which belong to superfamilies, which are common to all five of these organisms. So what you see is that uh, the, when you look at an organism in terms of the structural domains that it has, there's very little variation. Basically, the building blocks, the domains, the domain superfamilies from which the proteins are built is roughly the same in all organisms. So going back a bit to when genomes were first sequenced, there was a, sequence, there was a big surprise for everybody, which is that um, people expected the number of genes to reflect the number of complexity and, of course, sorry, the amount of complexity. And of course, um, there were not such large differences in the number of genes in organisms um, as we perceived the differences in their complexity. And so what this shows um, is that their differences in terms of their repertoire of structure is, is even less. However, um, if you think of proteins in terms of uh, this, this concept that Cyrus came up with of domain architectures, which is that um, you can express any protein in terms of its unique combination of um, domain superfamilies and the order in which they appear. And here we have a pictorial representation of a random selection of, um, of proteins from the mouse genome containing SH3 domains. So if you take the previous way of um, uh, looking at things in terms of structures, you can then recast the same thing in terms of domain architectures. Now, this is um, a figure which tells the same story as this figure, but it came later in a paper that I'll, uh, I'll tell you about in a couple of slides. What I'd like you to look, here, uh, look at here is just the far left column, which is the human genome. 
and the, the height of the, the total height of the black bar, the total height represents um, all of the domains in the human genome. Now, colored up to the point of uh, red, which is about 97% of the domains, these belong to superfamilies which are common to almost all animals. Okay, so this is the same story of invariance for structure. But the same thing can be repeated for domain architectures, and we see a very different story. I'll just, if you look at the left column, I'll flip back and forth. So now the red bar, instead of covering 97%, only covers 60%. So this means that only 60% of the architectures in human are also present in most animals. And what I didn't tell you is that there are no structural superfamilies unique to human. However, there are well over 100 completely unique architectures. So this shows that although the building blocks, the structures are invariant across organisms largely, the ways in which they are duplicated and recombined uh, uh, to provide longer domain architectures does in fact contain uh, a lot of the information required to explain the difference in complexity at the protein level um, uh, between organisms. Um, and finally, the third uh, uh, evolutionary um, discovery is that although the superfamilies are invariant across the genomes, within a superfamily you can have subfamilies, and these subfamilies may have slight variations in structure and sometimes function. And so what was shown was that um, for, for specific families, there were um, uh, differences which are lineage specific. So this also um, added to the story of showing how just looking at proteins, despite the limited number, of, uh, the, despite the limited difference in the number of genes between organisms, um, there was a great deal uh, to explain the difference in complexity between organisms based on their lineage specific families and also um, the differences in the domain architectures. So this uh, um, table, which is shown here, is um, using data taken from the 2006 paper. But the figure, plus the ones on the previous two slides, are actually taken from this paper in 2009. Cyrus was invited to write a review on uh, uh, molecular evolution for the bicentenary anniversary of Darwin's birth. And I think that this particular review captures not only these three discoveries of, uh, uh, for evolution, which I've just described, but it also captures many others, um, which I don't have time to mention. So um, I should finish by uh, saying that Cyrus has had other outputs. And, um, uh, but, but before that, I'd like to sort of look back at um, uh, uh, all of this, this presentation and see that um, Cyrus, what Cyrus has given us are um, through his unique way of thinking and looking at data and organizing things is, is discoveries which has led to basic knowledge of biology, um, which we now all uh, assume and pre uh, uh, to be true, um, and in fact, uh, uh, possibly even, even take for granted. And I think it would not be controversial to say that he is a, a father, um, one of the fathers uh, of the whole field of computational molecular biology and bioinformatics, which is the point of IS. CB and this meeting why we're all here. So um, this list of um, other outputs in terms of PhD students um, seems not to be complete. Um, so I will go to the last slide, um, which although is hard to see, is a more complete list of the Cyrus Chothia academic um, family tree, including further descendants and some important collaborators. So finally, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Cyrus for his contributions and in congratulating him. And so I'd also like to give my thanks to uh, Arthur, Stephen, and Julian for uh, a really nice presentation. Thank you very much.